Welcome back to the second hour of our study. Uh, we're on uh, lesson 46 of the CMS series, the Conscience, Morality, and Spiritual Life series. And uh, we're still, still in the introduction, uh, <laughs> I hate to tell you. Um, as part of the introduction, we're looking at a review of the Enneagram that we covered a few years ago uh, because I think it's the most uh, elaborate of the systems to look at human behavior, human thinking, human characteristics. And so we're reviewing all of that so that we can uh, use it as a means of understanding the happiness attainment motivators, the human good side of the happiness attainment motivators, the moral aspects of our human nature. There are six happiness attainment motivators that we all share. The chemical, the religious, the approbation, the power, the materialism, uh, and the uh, sexual. And we all, as human beings, try to find happiness in one or more of them. And in certain situations, we'll transition from one to another. And the Enneagram clearly depicts three basic ham types. The approbation type, which the Enneagram identifies as the type 2, 3, and 4. The power-based types, the 5, 6, and 7. The religious types, the 8, 9, and 1. Within the Enneagram system, those three are broken down if we look at them from a ham perspective, from a happiness attainment motivator uh, perspective. Looking at the six hams, we can see them in these three breakdowns of the, uh, of the nine aspects of the enneotypes. The enneagram, because the adherence to it found over the years that it did not explain all of human behavior, added three subtypes or three instincts to their study. Uh, the instincts were social, sexual, and self-preservation. We understand in our study of them that the self-preservation relates to the ham of materialism. The social, of course, is another approbation uh, strategy. And the sexual, of course, is sexual. So the uh, study of the Enneagram contains five of the six hams in the way they break it down. They have the sexual as a subtype. They have the chemical missing, described, but not listed as one of their categories. Uh, they have the religious uh, and as, a, as a type. They have the approbation as a type. They have the power as a type. And they have materialism as a subtype. So they have all of them as some sort of a category, uh, either a type or a subtype or instinct, and for five of the six. The only one lacking is chemical, and that's because uh, chemical throughout the people who studied this was not a big deal. They, they mention chemical quite often. Uh, in fact, uh, we saw it, uh, or we'll see it here with the seven coming up, uh, that they talk about the chemical aspect. Um, they talk about it quite a bit with a four. They talk about it quite a bit with a nine. Uh, but um, they didn't actually have a distinct category for the chemical ham. All the others, they do have a distinct category. And of course, as we saw when we went through the DSM-4, uh, the personality disorders that we went through to look at, uh, we saw that most of the personality disorders revolved around what? Which ham? Approbation. Approbation. Approbation is number one. Everybody wants to be loved and cared for and, and, uh, and respected and so on. So that's why there's actually two. There's a type uh, of approbation, uh, the three types, the two, three, and four. But also there is 
a subtype, the social, the social subtype. So again, the, the Enneagram system identifies that, that overwhelming amount of approbation that uh, rules in our lives. So we're going to look at the seven and see uh, a little different type of power structure, uh, power strategy here, and go through the seven in our last hour, and then we'll pick up next hour, uh, I'm sorry, next week, in the first hour, we'll conclude the seven, looking at the seven subtypes, and then we'll start on the eight. We'll start on the eight. And I want you all here, sitting in your seats, on time, while we study the eight. Okay? Well, that's the one, but the eight is the boss. Okay? The bossy, powerful, get, do, straighten things out. Okay. All right, this, uh, before we start the seven, let's have a time of prayer. Uh, let's begin with a moment of silent prayer so you can confess your sins uh, to the Father. And, and uh, uh, be, be uh, forgiven of those sins and uh, <laughs> cleansed of all unrighteousness and back in fellowship so that you might learn something about uh, how to act, how to, how to live uh, in our Enneagram human happiness attainment motivators, okay? So, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, we, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please pray with me. Father, as we study this hour, we ask for insight into uh, those of us who might be sevens, uh, those of us, of course, who have seven strategy in our lives as a way of coping with our humanness, a way of trying to, to grasp onto some form of happiness in the human realm uh, because we don't know enough about the joy that you have for us in our spiritual lives. We thank you that you have given us those spiritual lives. Each of us has our own and we have that reservoir of righteousness to tap into so that we might experience righteousness, peace, and joy at all times, under all circumstances, whether dealing with humans or not, whether uh, we are, find ourselves in a situation of uh, negative uh, energies, negative uh, treatment, negative uh, uh, possibilities, that we can still have your joy in all situations. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. People of the Enneotype 7 are essentially concerned that their options remain open, their lives unconstrained, and the, their ability to find happiness unfettered by what they see as a largely, uh, the largely petty concerns which seem to consume most people. Sevens are determined not to allow their lives to succumb to boredom or inertia or to the lethargy of a dull pedestrian existence. Sevens want more than that. The seven always wants more. Stimulation is their key word for the seven. They need to be stimulated so that they don't have to stop and think because they have fear because of a lack of sense of power. So they are going to uh, attack life uh, to hide their lack of feelings of power uh, and they're going to attack it to be stimulated so that they don't have to stop and think about what could go wrong to them or with them. Here's the human happiness uh, cartoon from uh, uh, Claire uh, Cherikoff. Uh, the, the happy seven, they're finding satisfaction in where they are, they're enthusiastic but content, and they're no longer fearful of boredom or pain. Then the seven, while they're not so humanly happy, they're worried about missing out on all the good things life has to offer. Uh, pain, boredom, I'm out of here. They don't want anything to do with that. Uh, they're enthusiastically chasing the next high in their, uh, in their experiences. And there's the seven that realizes that there is no happiness or that they haven't found it yet uh, in human happiness. Uh, they can't find satisfaction. 
Uh, oh no, I've been the rolling stone that's gathered no moss. Recklessly pursuing fun at the expense of their health, wealth, and relationships. The seven is our quick thinkers who have a great deal of energy and who make lots of plans. They tend to be multi-talented, creative, open-minded, and resilient people who do their best to appreciate their lives. Youthful and suicent and facile, sevens are the enthusiasts who enjoy the pleasures of the senses and who don't believe in any form of self-denial. Given such an ebullient description, it might be difficult to understand the fact that sevens are essentially fear types who are in flight from their pain, always striving to remain one step ahead of their inner demons. But such is the case. There is a sort of existential claustrophobia at the heart of any a type seven. They sense that the walls are always just about to close in, that they lack power. They therefore develop strategies for escape. These strategies are primarily mental and sevens like fives and sixes are fixated in the mental center. Sevens are full of plans for the future, exciting ideas, original thoughts, and unusual attitudes. They like to fantasize and conceptualize, but as soon as they attempt to work through the fine details of their ideas or plans, they tend to feel constrained and powerless because they don't feel like they can work it out. So they got to jump ahead to the next thing. To escape this feeling of constraint, sevens push forward into action. They look outside themselves for their means of escape. For this reason, sevens are the most energetic and active of the Ennea types. They tend towards extroversion, generally know lots of people, and are especially fond of collecting those they find unusual, entertaining, or stimulating. <clears throat> sevens also tend to be impulsive. They are willing to pick up and move at a moment's notice, to change jobs on a whim, and to experiment with alternative lifestyles. Sevens frequently know who the cool people are, what the best restaurant is, which new musical group is the next great band, which bestseller is really worth reading. Immersion in what the world has to offer frequently serves to refine the palate and sevens don't like to settle for second-rate distractions. As sevens are essentially afraid of being overpowered by negative states of mind, they seek their distraction in the external world and generally excel at multitasking and adventure-seeking. They can frequently be counted on to bring energy and excitement to situations which have begun to grow stale. Sevens have the gift of sensing the potential in a situation, of seeing the ideal in the actual. One of the reasons sevens do this is that it <clears throat> serves to juice up their experience. Idealization, paradoxically, makes experience feel more real to sevens. Here again, the mental nature of the type seven fixation manifests itself. About this feature of any a type seven, Naranjo says, <coughs> pardon me, it is possible to say that the opt optimistic attitude of type seven and the joyful mood that is habitual to them would not be possible without the operation of idealization in regard to the world in general and the more significant people in it. In relationship with others, as in connection with oneself, optimism entails the suspension of criticality and blaming. <coughs> Excuse me. In some key respects, the idealization process can prove beneficial, inspirational even, as others might very well be motivated to attempt to bring the actual situation closer to the ideal that the seven is able to envisage. The seven's enthusiasm can prove contagious. On the downside, the idealization process can serve to distract the seven from the reality of the situation and to undermine true intimacy in personal relationships. Insofar as the seven is relating to an idealization of the partner, the real person remains unseen and the seven essentially disengaged. Just as sevens tend to adopt an idealized version of those who are important to them, they typically also have a high opinion of themselves and their talents. Sevens tend to focus on their strengths and virtues and to downplay their flaws and vices. Their exuberance and self-confidence can carry them some real distance. 
having convinced themselves that they are really more accomplished than they are, they can generally convince others as well. All of this is compounded by the fact that, in general, sevens actually are people of high ability, smart and personable. They can usually do better than most without even trying. But a natural aptitude and a quick grasp of basics combined with an, an engaging presentation is not the same thing as true expertise and goes some way towards indicating why Akadzo used the term charlatan as the name for the fixation of any type seven. They're very, they appear to be very, very uh, brilliant, talented, um, but there's no real depth to it because they, they avoid that, that deep thinking uh, in their minds. They, and so they, they really don't have a depth. But if you walk into a gathering, a party, and you just look around, probably the seven is going to be the center of attention of a group of people. Okay? They're going to be the center of attention. They're, going to be, they're either going to be playing a musical instrument are telling stories, doing something, but they're going to be they're going to be the center of attention when you have a group. If you go to a party, a big party, then you'll probably have more than one seven in different locations with groups around them uh, listening to them uh, because they they're very they have high ability. They're very smart. They're very personable. They're usually talented people, and uh, but they're but they're often gone. You know, say, be one of those kind of people who say. What happened to so-and-so? They used to come all the time, but they don't show up anymore. Well, they're off with another group because they got to feeling vulnerable with the group you were with, so now they've gone off with another group. Okay. As sevens have a compulsive need to avoid pain, and as they tend to search for, to, uh, for escape externally, sevens are prone to addictions of all sorts. The essential nature of addiction involves the drive to find solace, and a sense of well-being in a source external to the self, something very close to the core of the type 7 fixation. See, my happiness comes from outside. Yeah, it's not from inside, it's from outside. It's the stimulation. Well, obviously, they're going to be vulnerable to addictions because they're looking for an outside source to give them uh, some sort of happiness. Human beings in general, and sevens more than most, can form addictions to many different things, shopping, gambling, drugs, or even to a particular sexual partner or to sexual adventures in general. Sexual adventurousness comes naturally to most sevens who are generally immune to society's messages that sexuality is shameful. The problem with this, of course, is that addictions tend, in the long run, to bring more pain than pleasure. They are counterproductive. Sevens tend to be rational, and generally come to realize this, the ones that figure it out, grow up. <laughs> Paradoxically, the same compulsive need which gave rise to the addiction in the first place can serve the seven in good stead when it comes time to break it, and sevens tend to have strong powers of the will. But until the underlying compulsion to avoid pain is addressed, there is always the danger with addiction-prone sevens that one addiction will simply be replaced by another. Picture the, picture the AA group uh, where they're attempting to break their addiction to alcohol and you can't make out the faces because of the plumes of smoke in the room and, and it's a never-ending uh, parade up to the coffee pot to pour another cup of coffee and you know, they're, just, they're, they're trading one addiction for another. And uh, that's why that AA has such a very poor track record in actually helping people. Uh, all it does is allow them to kind of feel good about themselves and switch from one addiction to another for a while. But that's kind of the seven, looking for something on the outside, changing one addiction to another to try to find happiness. Sevens are noted for their youthfulness, and many sevens seem younger than their age. Part of this can be accounted for by their open-mindedness, energy, and future orientation, orientation to the things of the future. 
On the downside, sevens can simply be immature. Childlikeness can give way to childishness, and open-mindedness and tolerance to self-indulgence and lack of discrimination. Less balanced sevens can be petulant when they don't get their way, irresponsible and willful. The mundane details of life, such as paying the bills, such sevens believe, should be dealt with by lesser mortals who don't find responsibility so cumbersome. Unhealthy sevens even make a virtue of their irresponsibility, convincing themselves that it is a sign of their innate superiority. They can't be bothered with those kind of things. Even somewhat more balanced sevens are often a bit self-centered, as everyone is, which manifests in an unfounded feeling of entitlement. They tend to feel as though they somehow deserve more than others, as though life owes something to them. As sevens don't want to confront their own darker emotions, they often find it difficult to acknowledge the pain that others experience. Once again, they can find it difficult to see others in their totality. This often leads to charges of insensitivity being leveled against the seven. Acknowledging the pain in others forces the seven to confront the pain within and triggers the deepest defenses of the type seven fixation. The seven's degree of health is directly proportional to their capacity to stay with their own, pla uh, with their own pain and to acknowledge and accept the pain in others. The more that sevens flee from negative emotions, the more their strength grows and the more likely they are to erupt into consciousness in the form of an anxiety disorder or a severe depressive episode. Sevens, of course, as upbeat as they generally are, do experience sadness and melancholy, just like anyone else, and one of the frequent sources of sadness for sevens is the frustration they experience as they come to realize how many opportunities for true self-development they have squandered by moving on to the next cool thing. They have depression and anxiety but they deal with it by forgetting it and moving on to something new to stimulate them. Okay. Sevens in general are the most talented of the enneotypes, but unless they focus on their talents, foster them, commit to them, nurture them, they will remain undeveloped and their promise essentially unfulfilled. You, people, uh, you, you probably know people who you say, wow, as sharp as they are, as talented as they are, they're great personalities. Just, they're very smart. Why can't they? Why can't? Why? Why do they never make it? Why do they never get there? Why? Why do they always run off in something else? You know? If the seven can call, can use these feelings of sadness and frustration as spurs to self-development, if in other words they can truly sense that their underlying strategy to avoid pain leads in the long run to more pain, perhaps they can break the spell of their compulsion. If not, the seven will once again seek distraction, move into action, and into the next adventure. In the traditional Enneagram, the vice or passion of Enneotype 7 is, is gluttony, and the corresponding virtue that of sobriety. In this context, gluttony does not refer to the desire to fill the belly, but to a more fundamental desire. It refers to a pervasively desirous state, to what Akadzo calls a state of always wanting more. They always want more. Sevens want more pleasure, more excitement, more distraction, more adventure, anything which will fill them up, anything which will keep the nameless object of their fears at bay. Sevens who are unable to face their demons never achieve their potential or the true joy they are, more than most capable of experiencing in its depths. Sevens who are able to confront pain, to stay with it, develop maturity and groundness groundedness. Sober sevens are the wise children of the Enneagram, capable of, capable of showing others how to delight in the beauty and brightness of the sensible world without running in fear from its shadow. Sevens with the six wing are generally more openly anxious and ungrounded than those with an eight wing. They tend to be mercurial and charming and generally more sweet-tempered and engaging than their eight-winged counterparts. Overall, there tends to be a more obviously manic quality to sevens with the six wing. Sevens with an eight wing are more success oriented, pragmatic, and driven. They can be overbearing in the pursuit of their desires and are generally more aggressive and competitive 
than those with a six wing. Sevens, when healthy, are considered Renaissance men. Consider in this regard such sevens as Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and William Shakespeare, Emile du, uh, du Ch uh, Chatelet, who defied the gender stereotypes of her time to become an impressive scientist and mathematician, was also a seven. Uh, quite a group of sevens. Da Vinci, Mozart, Shakespeare, highly talented, always looking for adventure, excitement, stimulation. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Edison manifest the inventive side of the type seven personality and many inventors have, in fact, been sevens. Famous artists include Gauguin, Dolly, and Bacon. The art of sevens tends to be vibrant and expansive, glittering surfaces with intimated depths. Famous musicians who are sevens include Mick Jagger, Iggy Pop, Bono, or Bono, I guess his name is, it? Bette Midler, Chuck Berry, and Elton John. <laughs> sevens are naturally drawn to humor, and many comedians have been sevens. John Stewart, Bill Maher, Robin Williams, Jim Carrey, Howard Stern, Elaine Boozler, Joan Rivers, and Mike Myers, to name a few. Okay? Remember what I said about the party. They'll always be gathered around. People will be gathered around them. But they tend to be a little flaky, too. Also, talk show hosts Larry King and Conan O'Brien. The counterculture movement of the 60s was permeated by type 7 energy and many of the figures who achieved prominence uh, in that period were sevens. Ram Dass, Timothy Leary, Lawrence Vanderpost readily come to mind in this regard. Charles Tart, transpersonal psychologist and early student of the Enneagram was also a seven. Likewise, the New Age self-help movement has been inspired by quite a few sevens. Marianne Williamson, Byron Katie, Mark Victor Hansen, Wayne Dyer, and Stephen Covey. Director Steven Spielberg, Federico Fellini, and Mel Brooks were sevens, or are sevens, because I think they're all alive. Huh? Fellini's dead? Oh, Mel Brooks did die? Yeah. No, that was Bugs Bunny that died. <laughs> well, that was Mel Blanc. <laughs> also, the recently deceased Hunter Thompson, the gonzo journalist, nobody seems to know what my crimes are, the charges are vague, I am actually on trial for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's, that's Hunter Thompson. Hunter, I think, Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, Hunter S. Thompson. Famous actors include Goldie Hawn, Warren Beatty, Cameron Diaz, Jack Nicholson, Joan Collins, Elizabeth Taylor, and George Clooney. So you can see what a seven is like when you see who are sevens. Huh? Psycho. Psychos. Okay. Crazy people. Uh, very talented. Uh, very adventuresome people, uh, very personable people, but they can have that dark side because they're running from the fear uh, of a lack of power over some aspect of their lives, some aspect of their environment. Sevens often have a perfectionistic streak. If a casual observer had insufficient knowledge, some confusion might arise between type 7 and type 1. In addition, seven and sevens and ones are both prone to feelings of frustration. Nevertheless, the two types are very different. Ones tend to be self-constrained and self-denying, whereas sevens tend, in contrast, to be expansive and even hedonistic. Sevens tend to have problems with immaturity. Ones are very much the adult. Ones tend towards rigidity. Sevens towards expansiveness. Ones toward moralism. Sevens towards libertinism. Both sevens and twos are expansive, extroverted, and generous. Both types often enjoy entertaining and the pleasures of the senses. Finally, both types can be needy. Sevens are more oriented toward their activities, however, where twos are the most focused on their relationships. While it is quite uncommon for fours to mistype as seven, it is not especially unusual for sevens to initially mistype as a four. In addition, from an external point of view, more extroverted fours, primarily those with a three wing, can, in some settings, look like sevens, and artistic sevens might resemble fours. This is because both types can be creative, unconventional, 
attention-seeking, and even flamboyant in their presentation. Nevertheless, fours are far less extroverted than sevens who truly seek out people as a principal means of distraction. Fours are comfortable with their negative mental states, even sometimes choosing to inhabit them, whereas sevens are in flight from the pain. As a general rule, sevens tend to overestimate the extent of their suffering and sadness because they find such mental states to be so threatening to their sense of self, they can uh, for, uh, therefore think of themselves as being more melancholic than they actually are. The melancholy of type 7 is primarily driven by anxiety, however, whereas that of type 4 has its roots in a feeling of worthlessness. Anxiety, fear, power issue, worthlessness, approbation issue. In addition, sevens are extroverts, whereas fives are true introverts, often pursuing a line of thought until they take it to the very end, unlike sevens who tend to move on when the intellectual work becomes too immersed in detail. I'm too busy to think about that. Okay? Seven is a, is a thinking person until it gets down to where it slows them down, and then that's enough. Okay? Got to move, move ahead. Sevens frequently underestimate the extent of their extroversion, giving them the sense that they are more five-like than they actually are. Because they sometimes enjoy their time alone, they reason they could not truly be extroverts. The overall pattern of the seven's life, however, ought to reveal the pattern of seeking distraction by way of engaging others. The five's life should reveal a pronounced pattern of withdrawing under stress. Because they sometimes enjoy their time alone, they reason they could not truly be extrovert. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a repeat uh, slide here. The overall pattern of the seven's life, however, ought to reveal the pattern of seeking distraction by way of engaging others. The five's life should reveal a pronounced pattern of withdrawing under stress. Sorry about the duplicate slides. Sevens and six can mistype, especially if the wing is strong. Both types can be high energy and intellectual, and both tend to have a quick nervous energy. Okay, sevens and sixes. Sevens, however, have a form, uh, far more optimistic outlook on life than do sixes, who are generally aware of just what might go wrong. Sevens tend overall to be more averse to responsibility than sixes. Sevens tend to look on the bright side, whereas sixes find it difficult to make light of their difficulties. Sevens and eights can mistype, once again, especially if the wing is strong, although it is more common for sevens to mistype as eight than vice versa. Both types can be dominating and both enjoy adventure. But eights lack the nervous energy of type seven, and unlike sevens, tend to focus quite readily on their chosen fields of activity with which sevens have to struggle. Sevens and nines are both optimistic, and both types generally have a positive regard for others. Sevens are prone to self-centeredness, however, whereas nines often give too much deference to the thoughts and feelings of others. Sevens tend to throw themselves into activity under stress, whereas nines are prone to withdrawal. Sevens are more hyper, nines more grounded. Sevens and threes are each outgoing and talented, and both types can be self-centered. But sevens are scattered, whereas threes excel at focus. Threes are oriented towards success, whereas sevens are focused on enjoyment. Threes care about their impressions on others, whereas sevens, who are often quite popular as well, will sacrifice the good opinion of others if it interferes with their desires and their own conception of what is valuable. Well, let's see here if we can find a, very, a couple of good movies.
I think I did it on the other computer. <laughs> I think I put that on the other computer. I can find I can find it here. Catch me if you can? Yeah. No. That's a seven? That's a seven? He was the one that the FBI ended up hiring because he was such a good con artist. Ed is a teenager. Yeah. He was posing as a doctor. Oh, by, yeah, by the time he was 17, 19 years old, he posed as a doctor, several different things, yeah. Is that? It's not there. It's just a picture of it. I know I clicked on these before. Well, I thought I was right, going to go right to this. Uh, This might be it. Nope. <laughs> I thought I, I did save it, but I saved it on the other computer that I was working on. So I have... Uh, don't have it close at hand. But it should be here. She has a very, there we go. All right. Let's see if we can. Uh, flip the light switch off for me, please. This is a. Uh, Personality uh, type six. This is just clips from it. You can buy the whole thing.
from the age of 10 perhaps I decided to, to hide it. It's um, a constant um, uh, checking for uh, what's going on and is this situation safe? It's like you're always washing your back. You know, there's just a, a guard that's always there to, it's designed to protect you. But it gets really overused. Most of the time, it's actually not necessary. I'm sure. Well, it's insecurity absolutely drove my life as a child. The, the only thing I ever wanted or ever said to anyone was, do you love me? But now I've understood, having worked through it and through it, actually what I was saying was, will you be the one to kill me or not? A sixes desire for safety and security. That ideal. Well, that's, that's what runs the show. I mean, it's all about staying safe. Making sure that you stay alive. Yeah. Yeah. And how, what do you do to stay safe? Well, the main, the main strategy is really being friendly to people. Mm -hmm. Because um, they are all after me. <laughs> um, we had doubt works. Like, what's this mental voices? Yeah, uh, there's many of them. Um, telling you what to do, uh, telling you shouldn't have done things. Yes, yeah, it's a constant um, doubting and judging of your actions, um, whatever they may be. There's a constant doubting of what you're doing and where you're supposed to be and wanting to know what to do and not trusting the in a, um, yeah, the, the intelligence, the natural intelligence, because you're out of touch with it, you know, living um, in a tiny little space somewhere up here. Fails now. <laughs> it's uh, just amazing to, yeah, it's just beautiful to have uh, the possibility, because then, um, you really can't move into lasting doubt. Is it now that you've seen through these different veils and you can recognise as kind of like the way the body-mind stream works and it's not, not who you are? And... I get caught sometimes, but essentially it's just beautiful to be alive and beautiful to live. This is my neighbour Elvis, and he's a party dog. His best friend is Oliver. They both have a full social calendar because their owner has a seven fixation. If I ever need a laugh, I go next door. Sometimes uh, I make them really nice, you know, like a picture uh, with flowers around and uh, yeah. But it's always honest, you know, and but, uh, make it a little bit more rich, you know. <laughs> I must have light and I must have laughter, I must have humor, I must have friends, I must have people uh, and I, um, I, I'm like a, a moth to a flame when it comes to wanting to have people around me. I am drawn to groups having fun or, or vice versa. Maybe Swain says people are drawn to me because of the fun I have. Whatever way, it doesn't matter. I just, I need to have that and, that and I must have that because it's, you know, it's as vital as water to sustain life for me almost. I really do it. I do, and I know that of me, I do. But that's not to say there aren't the serious and the hard and the tough, but in amongst it, that's fine. It's not my major part of my life. Major part of my life is probably fun. Do you find yourself like, because you're so buoyant and up and happy, that that spreads to people that you're with, and so you'll visit people and spread your charm. 
you know, put them in a good mood and then leave after a while? Uh, I'm not a social guy, you mm -hmm. know. I like to be by my own a lot, you know. But I can be social and when I'm social, I make the people laugh. I like to make the people laughing and I'm a funny guy, you know. I think I'm, I'm funny and, and uh, I bring the sunshine in. You know, and... I suppose that goes back to when we lived overseas. We just took every day as it came. And I enjoyed that. So hitchhiking is my analogy. I loved hitchhiking because you never knew how far the journey was going to take you. You never knew who you were going to get in the car. You never knew what kind of car. You never knew what kind of story the guy was going to tell you. It was really quite exciting getting you to hit hitching because I just loved the unknown. And I started uh, on the spiritual path to get uh, enlightenment and to waking up. I, in the morning I waked up and I was always singing, you know, and I think, oh, this day it's beautiful, the sun is shining, the birds are singing their songs and uh, everything, it's so perfect, it's so beautiful, the father in the sky or in the paradise, it's looking to me and I'm, you know, and I was singing, you know, I really was, uh, I was singing and make the day uh, happy and okay and uh, beautiful, you know, like a trance. I was putting myself into a, into a trance. Yeah. But now, since I'm working uh, uh, with this, with this uh, Enneagram, it's, uh, it's not anymore the same, you know, something, uh, something stopped. Uh, sometimes it stops and okay, now what I'm going to do, you know, and I can see it's a, it's a habit or it's a, it's the program, it's a, a working to make me look around for something new and then I, I can stop this, you know, and take me back to the present. And when I'm back in this present, I, I experience peace and Okay, did you uh, find that uh, helpful to see the uh, actual people? And the, uh, I thought their little films were quite interesting, entertaining, well done. It's almost like a seven did those films. And I think she might have a little seven in her because she uh, certainly likes to do lots of uh, diagrams and drawings and so on in her uh, her presentations. Uh, sixes and sevens, like fives, are part of the power strategy for happiness in one way or another. And the thing you'll notice about all of these strategies is that some it is to go for power, some it is to avoid uh, situations of power. Their own scares them or someone else's scares them. So uh, we'll uh, uh, look at the rest of our seven next time and then get into the Enneagram eight. We probably won't do a whole lot of seven. Uh, we'll just uh, finish it up and then we'll spend most of the time next week on the eight because there's a lot about the eight that we uh, can know so we'll uh, look into that. Um, any questions? Any questions from the sixes? Any questions from the sevens? Any, uh, anybody want to deny that they're a six? Or that they're, a, or that they're uh, really doing what they're doing as a seven? Well, we're all out to get you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into our time of petition and supplication. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet together and to study uh, what human nature is like. 
so that we can understand that uh, in contradistinction to our spiritual nature and the things that you have provided for us. We ask that the Spirit show us when we're acting like uh, any of these uh, ham uh, strategies in our daily life so that we can recognize what we need to reckon as dead so that we can then uh, function in our spiritual natures and be able to provide your life to those around us and to glorify you in it. We thank you that you have given us the alternative to these happiness attainment motivators so that we do not have to struggle with them, but we can enjoy the righteousness, peace, and joy of our reservoir of righteousness. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.